in November uh, 14th after delaying the original May opening due to the pandemic. And then just two days after we opened the show, the museum needed to close again due to the governor's orders. So um, this is the next best thing we can um, offer, uh, us all being able to come together virtually to celebrate the exhibition. Since many of you may have not been able to see the exhibition during the two days that it was open to the public, we did produce a short walkthrough video narrated by Justin Hoover, our curator, which highlights the work installed in the space. And let me get the video, just give me one moment. Hello, my name is Justin Hoover. I'm the curator of this exhibition called Guilty Party here at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle. This exhibition deals with how we overturn narratives of oppression and misogyny that are built into the fairy tales that we grow up with. Upon entering the gallery, you are face to face with Saya Wolfox's 2014 video, Life Products by Kamatech. Life Products by Kamatech is a short video that takes the form of a speculative and fictional corporate advertisement come infomercial. The work builds on a rich body of art that investigates female, feminist, and intersectional identity within the framework of corporate operations in an alternative future. This work explores the transgression of physical limits and human boundaries to establish a post-humanist identity. Continuing forward into the gallery, you will be in, within the space of the artwork of Mail Order Brides. Uh, they are presenting here a new manifestation of an ongoing project called Mananagang Google, a technology company with a sinister mythological feminist twist. The Mananagang is known to be a vampire-like mythical creature of the Philippines. Traditionally, a malevolent, man-eating, blood-sucking monster capable of severing its upper torso and sprouting bat-like wings to fly into the night in search of its victims. It is also a story that expresses the deep roots of misogyny in traditional cultures and how these injustices are perpetuated, often through fairy tale. Since the witch is always an independent woman living alone at the edge of a village, or usually is, this ancient tale finds new footing in the identity of the elite female corporate executive. Turn the corner, you'll see Chanel Matsunami Govro's They Watch You Thrive, a 2020 silkscreen printed installation using fabric, hair extensions, and tatami. This work embodies Hayakume, a Japanese folklore creature, or yakawai, with multiple mouths hidden in her hair. In the traditional folklore tale, this woman meets a man who marries her, and the man is demanding that she doesn't eat anything. She says she will never eat anything. But in the night, she wakes up, and the extra mouths hidden in her hair consume all the rice. The husband finds out, and in different versions of the story, he either kills her, banishes her, or in some cases, she kills and eats him. By juxtaposing these spirited eyes and monstrous sets of teeth, Matsunami Govro looks to evoke ancestral expressions that offer both joy and fierce protection for her family and kin. In a way, this work imagines the spirits of her queer and Asian American ancestors looking towards the present and future generations for affirmation and for vicarious liberation. As we head to the final gallery, we will see the work of Jody Lin Ki Chow. This piece called Picnic Parade is a mixed media installation with performance elements created in 2017. Picnic Parade is a performance and sculptural installation using wearable art made of cloth, vinyl picnic table coverings, fruit, water, and other mixed media. The work centers on the artist afro chinese Jamaican body performing the character of a queen in procession. The artist persona also refers to Oya, the African Yoruban Orisha, or spirit, who according to the artist is commonly associated with the marketplace. Through her presence and role, the performance elevates and empowers the figure of the Jamaican marketplace woman to that of the queen, the goddess figure. You see an entirely white male entourage serving this queen figure, this black goddess figure. And this work overturns colonial, ethnic, racial, and gender divisions. This work takes a lot of the systems of oppression from colonial history and through this funny reversal of the role of man and woman, of gender, of power, she, pre she creates a really generous moment of offering 
of healing and of joy. Coming down this central corridor, we will see the work of Jeffrey Augustine Sonko, who was raised by Filipino immigrants and devout Catholics. Jeffrey's work often deals with this identity issue of engaging his Catholicism, but also his sexual identity and his sexual orientation in ways that both showcase exuberance and community and love and touch, but also how this deals with the uh, contradictions with religion and with Catholicism in particular. The images here showcase uh, historical and classical figures like uh, St. John, John the Baptist and other the uh, theistic individuals, but also uh, they show classical sculpture from Greek and Roman era. Uh, what you'll see is a bunch of beaded, uh, a, a bunch of painted dots around their necks as though they're wearing beaded necklaces, dealing with those issues of Mardi Gras, of sexual touch, of promiscuity, and also um, referencing the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, who used beaded necklaces to talk about the AIDS epidemic, the need for touch, but also the uh, potential danger with uh, unprotected sex and HIV AIDS. So uh, this work will lead you towards the end of the exhibition where you'll come out and you'll see the same beads going up and down the entrance stairwell. And again, this work is by Jeffrey Sonko as well. And again, asks you to consider what it means today to touch, to have that sense of identity around touch, around who we're with, around how we explore our, our identities in that way, especially in a time when we are facing a new global pandemic where uh, hygiene and, and physical touch become an issue again. With this, I say thank you very much for being with our audio tour and go and check out the exhibition. Thank you very much. So you heard a bit from Justin Hoover in that video, but I'd like to introduce Justin who will be moderating the rest of the program today. Justin works with time-based visual arts for community engagement and collective social actions. Since 2004, he has worked as a curator and gallery director, focusing on exhibition production, participatory engagement design, and public programming, ranging from conventional white uh, wall art shows to pop-up happenings to public art. Currently, Justin works as the founder and principal of Collective Action Studio, an art production, curation, and engagement design company focusing uh, in the Bay Area and internationally. Justin has also performed, curated, and exhibited at numerous venues around the world. Welcome, Justin. Hi. How's it going? Can you all see me? All right. Good. Yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, wonderful. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I will talk for a second just about my own work to introduce where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a West Coast-based curator. I live in the Bay Area. I was born in Berkeley, raised in San Francisco. And uh, I have mixed ancestry. My mother is an immigrant from Taiwan, uh, but she is part Russian as well. So I grew up, uh, you know, with my mom uh, and my dad here uh, in the Bay Area uh, with a community of Chinese and Russian Americans all around me. And uh, in my work, I explore issues of age, race, and gender identity through the lens of contemporary art. <laughs> I curate exhibitions, develop public programs, and organize events, festivals, and happenings, as Jessica said. Uh, often these reflect and engage diasporic or historically oppressed communities. So working again from that place of identifying with immigrants, um, with uh, people who maybe uh, are multicultural, intersectional, and working with um, trying to build space for uh, those d diverse viewpoints. Um, I feel personally I've inherited a great cultural legacy um, with assimilation and wayfinding, but also like the, the challenges around assimilation. Like how do, you, how do you do that in a just ethical way? How do you, I know that word is often very weighted uh, and, and negative in a lot of ways, but how do we promote equity really is, it, is the issue? What are the tools of empowerment and how do we uh, establish access for diverse perspectives and diverse peoples. Um, so a lot of my work deals with these like personal histories and finding traction for new generations of artists to use their cultures, to produce culture that you know creates this space for us. Um, this exhibition, Guilty Party, is about self-identity. 
It's about expressing oneself through costume, through gesture, through fiction, and through satire to some degree. Uh, it's layered, as you'll see, with um, racial, uh, colonial, and decolonial um, issues, gender and gender issues, gender identity, sexual identity, and how the work challenges in, uh, the contradictions and the, what are the challenges and contradictions of being intersectional, queer, Asian Americans today, and what is the history and the legacy of this exclusion? What is, how does it, how does it uh, manifest on us in our work in the age of the selfie, mass media, and with digital information so prevalent? Um, you know, as an Asian American, I like to think back to my ancestors a lot, always thinking back to the people who came before me. And, uh, you know, I feel like I have um, inherited this long, um, great cultural legacy, but I also look to the future. So, you know, as an artist and a curator and, a, you know, this great community that we're part of, we have to reinvent what we're doing. So I started seeing these amazing artists uh, around and around the whole country, really. Uh, they were creating work that specifically was drawing on the stories that we grew up with as kids. So I saw artists working with fairy tale issues, artists working with ghost stories, artists working with uh, religious stories, artists working with archetypal narratives uh, as source material for work and creating and inventing these stories in new ways. So what struck me about these, this body of work, which we'll get into with you know questions and conversations with the artists in a minute was, uh, not only the quality of the work, you know, it's really beautiful work that people are investing in it, they invest their time, their resources, their money, you know, uh, but they're they're risking themselves. There's a lot of risk in this work. And people say, well, what is that? There's artists. They're making artwork in the studio. And that's not true. These artists are out in the street. They're in the public space. Even if they are in the studio, they're making decisions that uh, might alienate them further from different ancestors or different communities. You know, they're using their bodies in performative ways to express themselves, which physically puts the body at risk or challenges conventions of how we are supposed to use our bodies and present ourselves in conventional society. And uh, in this way, these, work position, these works position contemporary performance central to the work. And I think that's very special today. It's bold, it's challenging, and it's, and it's relevant today. Um, these people are creating, these artists are creating live elements in their work. They're inventing personas to, um, to express themselves and creating lived actions in the world. And I think this is very, very important. Uh, we began um, planning this exhibition in 2017. So you can imagine a few things have changed since then. Obviously, the pandemic situation has changed a lot. Um, but I'm excited to be here. Busy professional like Wing Luke Jessica and everybody who uh, has uh, Rustrada, Eliza Barrios, Jennifer Wolford. Uh, Saya Wolfock is a new friend of mine who I just absolutely am in, just enthralled by uh, her work. And Jody Lynn Kichow, who had the uh, beautiful support of the artist Charlene Stevens to help her create the work. And um, so I'm really happy to be here for every, with everybody. I'm getting some notes that uh, I'm coming up choppy. So uh, with, anyway, that's my intro. So I'm going to um, give it up there and... Uh, yeah, uh, we can start to, uh, do you need, does anybody need me to repeat anything? Say in the chat if you need me to repeat myself. Do I have to go back? Okay. I'm sorry if I got broken up. Um, great. So you all can hear me now. So, um, okay. So Chanel says, okay, thank you, Chanel. So uh, what I was saying was just the, uh, the artists are really inspirational to me. Jody and Charlene making amazing work. Uh, all of the mail order brides, Jeffrey Chanel um, and Jody uh, and Saya, of course. And uh, now that was my last statement. So um, I would like to now continue with the rest of the talk, bringing on um, our first conversation. Um, Jessica Rubenacre, would you let me know, is this the correct order of things? Am I now asking questions now? I'm sorry, I don't have the schedule in front of me. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, I would like to invite Chanel to uh, start her camera. <laughs> and you guys in the chat, feel free to keep bringing up things. Yay, sunflower. I don't know what that means, but go for it. Uh, Chanel, I guess maybe that's a... 
That's my nickname. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. I That's my that. nickname that my house mother gave me. So it's just representing Wonderful. in the chat there. Awesome. Hey, Mama. There you are. I see you. <laughs> hey. Awesome. Hey, thanks for being here. I'm so happy to be here. So Chanel and I know each other from years ago uh, when Chanel was in an exhibition uh, at a space I was working on on the West Coast here. Um, and I just was blown away by Chanel's work. And uh, it was really fun, you know, fundamentally, which I think is super important. Uh, it was, it used her or their body in, in many ways that I thought was a challenge. So instead of being the object of the gaze, Chanel was flipping the gaze and looking at men in different ways to reverse the power. And so it's directly taking on issues that we have to confront all the all day in in people who work in media. You know, what's the power of the gaze? How do we create work that is not objectifying but empowering? So I, that was the first work I saw of Chanel's, and just you know stayed following as a big fan for years. And uh, Chanel's has been making amazing work ever since then. And then when I started talking with uh, Chanel about this, we started talking about these ghost stories and family stories, and um, you know, it's amazing. Um, opportunities to um, look back into our history and then find uh, like a ghost story or something that really challenging. The, the Japanese culture is so rich with stories, but there's often la layered with, um, it's often layered with, with challenging frameworks. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> why don't we start there? Chanel, would right. you be so kind as to tell us about it? In, in the intro video you watched, I, I spoke a little bit. I obviously don't speak any Japanese. I tried to use the words that you provided me. I don't know if I used those correctly. Apologies if it was incorrect in any way. But tell us about your the background to your work, and um, and then we'll we'll get into the work a little bit more. So start with maybe fairy tales. What's the symbolism that you used here? Then start with the story. Let us all know the context too. Absolutely. So there's um there, so the creatures are called yokai, and then there's many different factions of it. People get super super nerdy about it because. A lot of people get nerdy about Japanese culture, um, even if it's not their own culture. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's been interesting to unpack that. Yokai are connected to a lot of video games, um, to like like Pokemon. So it become it's a really big part of Japanese culture that influences a pop culture. But I, um, for this project, it was ended up being three main monsters that um, that I focused on. So I just want to show you all a little bit, give you a crash course on what yokai are. So let me just share this with y'all. All right, cool. Question from okay. Susan Platt. Can you give us the name of the character she is talking about monsters? Yeah, so I sure you, will. Just give yeah. me a moment. All right, cool. So I just wanted to show y'all. And yeah, Justin, you can throw things from the chat to me as well. I love, love that. Um, For sure. Oh, shoot. it's a slideshow. Give me a moment. I will definitely be talking about those and I'll put them in the chat later as well. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I can't get it full screen. It was working earlier, but um, let's just start here. So yokai, there's a ton of them. There's like, and they keep on finding more and more as people do research. Um, there are Japanese folklore monsters or horror stories, a lot of them. Um, some of them are friendly and really goofy. They involve a lot of humor, which I like. I like putting humor in my work. Um, so I focus, I started off with this one, which is the Yamamba. And it was really cool hearing about the mail order brides work. Cause I was like, dang, that's like, you know, there, there's a very strong connection um, with what I was hearing in there uh, with that particular monster from, um, from their narrative. So it's awesome to see those connections. But the Amamba is kind of this, I learned there's more of this umbrella um, mountain witch that can sometimes become other things, very shape-shifty. Um, the, the idea is that they're kind of outcast um, and were forced to live on the mountain by themselves. Um, so I started re embodying this monster and thinking of it as, well, if I don't know who my queer ancestors are, you know, a lot of us um, are not able to connect to folks like us um, within our backgrounds and our families because it wasn't safe to be out. It wasn't safe to be openly queer um, for a long time and, um, and still not for some people. So in order to make those connections and our histories, we have to build and imagine 
those. So I, so bringing together um, tangible, real folklore, <laughs> real folklore with this um, desire to connect with ancestors that I'm not connected with. So in this picture, I'm embodying um, the Amamba, which is known to have that really white platinum hair. Uh, that's a Kabuki image on the left. Uh, this is another incarnation of the Amamba uh, nursing a uh, Japanese hero in folklore, uh, Kintaro. So I reimagined that as uh, with Rilakuma, which is a Sanrio character that I'm nursing in this picture. So it's just really playing around and just having fun um, with uh, embodying these characters. So on the left is an image from the latex ball. It was my first ball. Um, New York City, and uh, so I, I, this is my, my work prior to this was a lot of armor referencing like Power Rangers, monsters, um, well, like robot monsters and creating a feminized version of them since they're often masculine and like the Transformers. And um, so then I kind of thought about, well, what's the prequel of this? So if this was like a movie series, what would the stripped down version be, the origin story? And so I kind of, when I'm making work, I kind of think of it that way like what if this was a movie or comic book and expanding on characters from there. So I ended up being like, well, what if it, the, it's this origin story was as a mountain witch? And uh, that's how I ended up in the forest there. Um, so another, then moving on from the Yamamba was the Futakuchi Onna, which means the double mouth woman. Um, and just like uh, Justin had narrated in the, you did a really good job with that, by the way, in hey, the thanks. video. Yeah. <laughs> she eats, but through the back, through her like hidden mouth. So that's how I ended up creating this imagery with the, the hidden mouths. And um, here's another image that I've been working on. I've been working with hot pink and blue, as you can see in the background, some of my newer work, um, expanding on this idea of teeth. Uh, this some of that costume I also used in a in a ball too, so that was that was fun. Uh, and then another another monster that I used was Hyakume, which means hundred eyed monster. Um, so you can see this on the left is a little bit more in the traditional style. It's by an author that studies yokai, um, author and illustrator. And then on the right was something I found on DeviantArt that I thought was a really cool um, rendition of a feminized. Uh, Hyakume. So I've been kind of surrounding these images and trying to bring together the work. Um, what I really liked about Hyakume in a lot of ways is that it was a gender and to have, and a lot of times like historical folklore figures are not really a gender, but the monsters were. So um, I fluctuate with feeling being very feminine and then also gender non-conforming. So I love how monsters can embody that as well. So just, uh, I'd like to step in for a second and just say sure. these creatures, they show up historically, right? But they're also very contemporary. Like you see these in anime, like you said, and I just love that about your work. They're, it's 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 so sharp in many ways, you know? And so a lot of people only look historically, okay, well, this is just historical document, but... <clears throat> Sorry, Justin, I can't speak froze. to their aid, but, you know, we can we know that these are classical... I froze? Oh, no. You're back. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, okay. So I was just saying, what I love about this. Oh, no, you froze again. At the, the class dynamic features. Oh, okay. sorry, Justin. Let's I, move I on. missed I'm all of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I'll just it's be okay. quiet. Just love the age good. range from classical to contemporary of these creatures. It's fantastic to see such a, a wide range of, of eras. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I also really enjoy that about yokai. That's what's very exciting to me about them. Um, in terms of the construction and how I kind of ended up with the installation that you see, I've been inspired by uh, Japanese kanzachi, which are hair decorations, um, traditional hair decorations for a long time. Um, and I used to make these also with my auntie. My auntie is a kimono maker, super, super old school traditional. Um, and I'm one of the, her only like kin that really loves the kimono. Like obviously like, it's, yeah, I love it so much. Um, and so here's like a really old throwback image of me. This is actually the picture on my 
about section on my website. Um, shape shifting transforming is something that I've been looking at ever since the beginning of my art career. Um, my character named Queen Ghidra is based off of the Godzilla monster, King Ghidra. Uh, so here you can actually see that I had made these hair decorations and um, and these, the ones in the inflation are essentially supersized versions of that. And for um, for my, my Japanese folks on there, I'm here also inspired by Teidama, which is made from ki um, kimono scraps, which are, which you, are children's toys. So this is essentially a formula of how this came to be. We have yokai plus kanzashi, traditional hair and fabric work equals what happened. <laughs> what ended up with the installation. So this is the meme of me creating, <laughs> creating the work that you see at the Wing Luke. I also got a shout out that I'm very, very, very inspired by cartoons, magical girl aesthetic, queer, um, uh, uh, characters like in Steven Universe. Um, and in terms of the eyes that I involved, it was very anime and cartoon inspired, which is, um, you can kind of see here, a closer, a close up version of some of my newer pieces that I'm working on involved um, using uh, kimono that, uh, that the sparkly eyes um, are very, very, they're, they're super important because it's this like emotion of adoration that I was really interested in that um, when we're like in awe of something, when we are appreciating something, um, kind of communicating it through, I, I love how cartoons have this magic ability to create that moment that, um, that really makes you feel something. And that essentially comes down to um, the title of the piece, They Watch You Thrive. It actually is inspired by a conversation that I had the first time I met my house mother, um, I was a member of the House of Ninja for a few years. And um, we we're sitting and having coffee and they were like, are you spiritual? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and she was like, and she like kind of stopped for a moment and was like, your ancestors are watching you. They're just, they're, they're peeping over the edge. They're peering over the edge and they're watching you. And they're so happy they're in awe. And thinking about that, thinking about my ancestry, whether that's, you know, blood ancestry, um, queer ancestry, that's where the title of this piece came from in terms of they watch you thrive, this idea of ancestors watching over us, um, specifically queer ancestry, and just being so happy and in awe of um, where we are and what we're um, able to do and be. So. Yeah. Do you have a picture of the installation at the museum lined up or should I pull that up? Um, I have one ready if you want me to. Yeah, go ahead. Do it. Do it. Okay. Let me see if I can share this right now. So you have to that. stop your share for a minute. Okay. Yep. Let me pull this up. So this is what we have. Whoops. That's the wrong one. Are you seeing that? Yes. Okay. So this is the installation as we see it in the wing loop currently. And I would like to ask you if you can talk very quickly, or I mean, take your time, whatever, but can you speak to what the material is that you're using here? Oh yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> it is all satin. I'm really, really obsessed with satin. Ever since I was young, I had this obsession. I think I've always loved fabric. Um, it also could be partially the, the garments that I grew up with as well, with the kimono too. But um, I just love how shiny it is. It could just be purely just, gut attraction. Um, these are all uh, drawn hand by hand. Then I redraw them in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, then I screen print them. Um, I screen print out of Shoestring Press in Brooklyn. Um, and then I cut them out. So actually I can show you. Um, so they look like this, some of my newer pieces. And you can see there's like a little dotted line for them. And uh, I'm like looking around for like half built pieces. Um, oh, here we go. So they kind of are start off like this, and then I create three other pieces that fit together. So you can kind of see here. Here we go. Um, and then I put in polyester filling, which makes them nice and fluffy. But I also like not fully stuffing some of them. Like in the in the show, um, half of them are are flush out, like the eyeballs, and then the teeth are not filled. 
And so it happens with the fabric as they get a little bit wrinkly and deformed, um, which gives them some personality that I really like. And it makes you able to see the, the top and bottom, which is the, the skin, the like wrinkly skin parts of it. Um, originally, I wanted this piece before COVID, I wanted the piece to take up the whole room and for the viewer, the visitor to be able to sit in the center and kind of imagine the centerpiece as a sh like a like a like coming out of their own head and so that they'd be able to interact with the piece in that way um but you know you got to adapt and uh it, it was really great working with the museum to get the tatami in there which was super exciting a lot of the stories that i grew up with the characters are on tatami and reading on and uh so it kind of incorporated the fairy tale and story element so Thank you so much. Uh, and one thing that um, I think we glossed over was the images that you first shared were using original, um, the, the material was uh, the, um, I'm blank on the name, it's the Japanese word, kimono. You were using classical, like old kimonos, right? I mean, when I saw your studio last year or year before, you were using real kimonos you had cut up. That sounds like a very almost sacrilegious act. Just will you mention what that it means to you? Sure. And yeah, I, I, it's like deeply like, yes, it is. It's totally that. It feels like, why am I destroying these incredible garments? Oftentimes they're handmade. Um, I am using vintage pieces, but they're all handmade pieces. But here, here's, here's what makes me feel better is that I often get them from like, like a like white woman's like boho boutique online so it's kind of like a homecoming in a sense where you're i'm rescuing yeah you're reclaiming it yes i'm like yeah. culturally rescuing the kimonos and putting them back and um you know bringing it bringing it back home in a lot of ways um kimono making is a big part of my family history um although i cannot bring myself to cut the family kimonos um i always outsource for them and yeah it's uh but i i think that i ask myself if and part of like yokai is believing that objects have spirits. I feel like if, if I was a kimono, rather than being in a closet that is con disconnected from its culture, I would rather be part of an exhibition um, that uh, showcased me. So. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. It's really awesome work. I'm really stoked to have you in the show and to see this new body of work develop and to continue talking more about this as the show runs and then continuing. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to switch it now and bring uh, Jeffrey Sonko up. And uh, Jeffrey's an artist. We know each other again for many years, and we went to the same school, but not at the same time. So shout out to the late, great SFAI. Maybe not so late, but definitely uh, SFAI. A bit troubled. But uh, anyway, um, Jeffrey is just an amazing artist that uh, has done a number of different works that are performative, that are sculptural, that are social practice, just a very diverse and very challenging, again, risk-taking body of work. Uh, we didn't receive a lot of funding that we wanted from this, in part because of Jeffrey. I hate to just call you out about that. But, uh, you know, your work is so challenging in many ways that things like the entities like the NEA are afraid of it. And they people will, will say... You know, the NEA will step and be like, wow, you know, like we can't, we don't know what this work means. And we're, it's, a, it's a difficult work. And I have to come back and tell them, well, this is important work about what it means to be at a crossroads today, intersectional in many ways. And so I think Jeffrey's work is ahead of his time in many ways. And, uh, you know, it, it's very, it is very difficult to unpack because on one side, you know, it's very like flamboyant and fun and colorful and the other side, it just it looks like it slaps on there, really uh, challenging and transgressive and confrontational uh, I, imagery. So, for example, I'm thinking specifically, he did a series of of robes that were KKK Ku Klux Klan robes that are in rainbow colors, you know. And that work specific is a very challenging work, and um, you know that we have to ask ourselves, you know, today and historically, what does that mean to have this kind of rainbow flag? work but in a lot of your work you know uh, we don't this we don't have to um we don't have to sp stay on that one topic but i'm just trying to say in general your work has a lot of layers in it is very exuberant is a word that i use about your word about your work um and it, it deals a lot with fear 
uh, anxiety, and in many ways with religion. And uh, with that, uh, I'll start just with an image quickly of the work that he has in the exhibition. Um, I'm going to pull it up real quick. It's going to take me a second here. Um, so we have uh, a few works here. You'll see a bunch of uh, collage pieces in the central gallery in which various classical sculptures have been collaged with paint dots. And you imagine the paint dots often with like fun, crafty things. But it's also really interesting because they look just like these beads. And here's a whole staircase covered in beads, you know. And so uh, I'm going to pass it now back to Jeffrey and just to ask him, what does this mean for you? What is the exuberance under, underlying your work? What is the driving force there? And, and even in the image in, that you have in your studio, the red and blue foil decorations, what does that exuberance mean? And why and how do you bring in these other um, images of religious figures or... Um, oftentimes pop cultural things, but still these are archetypal uh, people, archetypal images of uh, figureheads, maybe not father figure, but like people that you look up to in some ways or that often positioned as archetypes. So how do you balance that? What is that, that exuberance, that challenge, that fear and power? Um, can you hear me okay? Um, I am a Libra, so there's always going to be trying to get balance there. Um, no, but actually, just even with that little joke, a lot of my work is so autobiographical. Um, and even just in the intro video, you know, you mentioned my my um, my parents and them immigrating from the Philippines. And um, I think a lot of my work is just uh, representing the how I navigate, you know, really through the world um, coming out after college and um, as a gay man and um, just really finding ways to tell these stories um, that showed um, the anxieties that I experienced throughout life. Um, and the work here at the Wing Luke um, is celebrating, you know, this kind of ac activity, this behavior of um, throwing uh, Mardi Gras beads onto these statues. I, I've never been to Mardi Gras, um, but I, it has come up a lot in the research uh, about uh, within my work about brotherhoods and uh, American culture, uh, debauchery. That's actually the name of the, the series is debauchery. So, you know, just what do kind of these white American dudes do? Um, and I was born in 83. So, you know, I am going to college right at 2000 through 2005. And I was in a fraternity in, in college. Um, I was also closeted in college. Um, I was trying to blend in with, you know, my, my white brothers. Um, and those anxieties that I had staying closeted and trying to have a girlfriend. Uh, uh, I'm also 5'4", so I'm short, you know, like, and I'm skinny. And it's like, there's just so much there's so much of an identity that I tried to be um, as I was becoming uh, an adult, right? Um, and so the, a lot of my work revolves around these performances, these behaviors, these activities that identify us as someone. Um, and the people I surrounded myself with in college um, were bros. Um, and so actually, I, I, I would love to share this stuff, but... Um, so the work at the Wing Luke is, um, it's not related uh, to the main body of work I usually produce, which is called the Society of 2030. It's related in terms of um, some behavioral things, but uh, it, the narrative of the Society of 23, which is a fictional brotherhood that I created, is not specifically in this work um, at the Wing Luke. Um, what you do see is kind of the, the effects of bros doing things, the effects of bros drinking and then going out into the streets and throwing their beads onto these statues that might be at a cemetery in New Orleans or something, right? Um, so the work that um, I'm focusing on um, primarily is called the Society of 23. And I thought I'd show a picture of uh, the bros. So I actually play all, the role of all 23 brothers, right? Um, 
and I am, uh, and I started this in 2008. Um, and they have a little logo on their on their shirt. Um, and you know, Justin mentioned uh, in the intro about touch, the idea of touch. Um, and I really, I really love that because um, in this photo, as I photoshopped myself, and I, you know, stood in different positions, sat in different positions, photoshopped myself all together. You know, I'm not touching myself here. Um, so there's this absence of touch uh, within my photographs. Um, but I am an installation artist, and um, I invite the audience to, you know, touch the installation if you, if and when we get to go to the Wing Luke again. Um, I hope people can, you know, touch the beads. But even then, are we going to want to touch any surfaces right now? So it's been, it's been very challenging as an installation artist to uh, think about uh, the medium of installation and how um, how visitors uh, can interact uh, with with uh, the objects um, in the space. Um, I also have this. So I am uh, currently preparing for um, my first ever residency. Uh, which is going to be at Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh. Um, it's also 100% remote because um, I have made the, I've decided not to go uh, travel uh, at this time because of the pandemic. Um, so I am making an installation of the brother of uh, the Brotherhood, um, where the 23 brothers can show off all their awards <laughs> um, and celebrate um, how awesome they are. Um, and so um, I'm starting to collect costumes right now and create costumes. So this is a pair of sweatpants. Um, I don't know if it's flipped in the camera, but I just got a pair of sweatpants that say Society of 23. Um, and then also I have some plaques. I've got plaques and trophies and the installation is actually gonna be called, is called um, Society of 23's Trophy Game Room. So there's a lot of trophies and a lot of games. Um, I just made this plaque, let's see if we can see it, I'll, I'll read it out loud, but uh, it says Nicholas Jose, outstanding performance by a brother at a public event, 2003, right? So I get to play, I get to create these little stories about each brother and they all have names, they all have their own identities through the artwork as I create artwork about the brotherhood, I, I start constructing the identity of each brother as well as the construction of um, the society itself, uh, which is kind of a metaphor for how I've constructed my own self, um, how America has con constructed itself. Um, and the installation is going to be a uh, half court, half size bocce court. So um, one of the brothers or one of the games they play is bocce and one of the brothers won in 2014, the bocce award presented to Michael Angel for your tremendous efforts and execution. So again, uh, activities, performances. Um, the installation is very serious, um, but also there's some fun. There's some fun in it. Um, this one is a graphic that's you know a standard, super standard graphic that you can order on a plaque. And here it says, "Presented to Kevin Elijah for successfully running from all your problems, 2009." Um, so yeah, so I get to make these objects that form the that kind of define who the brothers are right like who said that mardi gras beads should be these plastic beads that then we will use and throw at each other if we expose our breasts right like who said that at some point this became a thing so i'm making a brotherhood as you know this metaphor for creating rituals creating performances um, that we do every day um and so the brothers even get ribbons and right? they get like first place ribbons um, and the trophy game room will actually only have first place items but um, at the mattress factory gift shop um, the society of 23 is donating um, second and third place um, ribbons uh, which will then be for sale um, and mattress factory shop will be the exclusive distributor of Society of 23's used and uh, fine and gently used memorabilia for a couple months. Um, I'm actually editing the consignment agreement um, at the Mattress Factory Museum as a site, as a medium itself. Um, so I'm very excited to uh, make the Society of 23 uh, this fictional brotherhood uh, 
more nonfiction, if you will, uh, and more official uh, through a medium like a consi consignment agreement. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm up to now. I'd like to ask you a question, Jeffrey. I'm really glad you're part of this show and thank you for working with us. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> your work, uh, one of the... Um, uh, one of the social groups you're working with is religious groups. And as a person who grew up Catholic, I think that often, you know, I, when I talk about your work to different people, you know, as a curator does, I often will say, well, his work. Deals with that and, and not practicing Catholicism today, uh, but you were raised in that framework. So, can you talk to me about what the religious aspect is and also a little bit about why you chose the, the people you did for the collage work you did that's in the show? Oh, sure. Um, let's see, religion specifically, I think um, for me personally, Catholicism is family. Um, my parents are devout Catholics and raised my sister and I um, through Catholicism. Um, my middle name is Augustine. It's my confirmation name. Um, so my family, my identity with my family um, is related to that religion specifically. Um, I'm going to make a strange analogy here, but it's like the Kardashians, right? Like the reality show is all about family. We don't know what they're going to do, where they're going to go, where they're going to fly to, how much money they're going to make. In the end, the TV show is about family. So for me, if someone was like, well, well how do you represent your family? Like what makes you... what? What do you think about when you think of your family? I think of going to church. I think of, you know, going to Christmas, Christmas church, Easter church, every Sunday church, um, going to private school um, when I was a kid. Um, so with that, then how do I suddenly negotiate this, like uh, this identity of being a gay man with this doctrine that's like, eh, that's not happening. So you know, uh, thankfully, my family is just so welcoming and it has, it was never a problem, um, so, uh, me being gay. So it's just so, it's cool to have that love, even with, you know, people who are very strict about this specific doctrine. And yet, what about me? Like, I, I was scared to come out, you know, I was scared to come out to my family, but it was not an issue. Um, so what was that for me and my identity with Catholicism, right? So I use Catholicism within my work because of that kind of strict, those strict rules and guidelines, but also with the brotherhood, um, it's about family. So um, there's a lot of uh, kind of elements from Catholicism that I then bring into um, the brotherhood, especially the rituals, right? Especially the, the things, the, the sacraments, the, the things we have to keep doing um, in order to be our best Catholic or brother self. Um, and then what was the second no, that, part that of the answered question? It. That answered all of it. I mean, okay. I that's, <laughs> that's it. I was asking about the religion and, you know, specifically why you chose these people in the images. Um, but the yes. images, I mean, this is a collage work that you're choosing people who represent the religious or the classical perspectives and how you're right. kind of queering them and how, you know, there's both fun and challenge there. It's difficult to show those create those people in a light that's in that's funny and humorous but you know you achieved that so i think that that really if correct me if i'm wrong or please add to it if you have other perspectives on why you chose those figures yeah you know even just a super base level on why i chose them is that um i could put necklaces on them these are um images that i cut out from a donatello book um not the turtle um and <laughs> um the statues um, there were so many different statues but I wanted a full figure. I wanted to center it on this piece of paper because I wanted to just spotlight this figure and then kind of drape and by drape, I mean um, dot these uh, little paint dots on, on the figure. And I just wanted to make it look really, just really theatrical, you know, a black background and maybe they're being spotlit like I am right now. Um, yeah. But you're really, you, you are reclaiming those people. You know, you're querying them because you're bringing them into your world. You're saying, what are these people had different perspectives at the time that maybe we assign a narrative to that may not be the, the whole complete narrative that they might assign themselves. So what I like about this work is that it opens up the public to imagine the past. 
Similarly, how Chanel was doing that in their work, we're looking at ancestry. And this is more of a philosophical ancestry than a genealogical ancestry. But we're looking at our ancestors and allowing color and ex exuberance and joyful play in the arts to reinvent who our past was, to like look to the future. So anyway, I just want to say thank you, Jeffrey, for showing your work with us and being part of this show and really helping us push the envelope. And, you know, it's been amazing to work with you as always. And uh, I would thank like you, to Justin. thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to ask Jody to uh, to enter the scene now. And I'll start with an image of Jody's work. Uh, let me pull this up. <clears throat> Here is Jody's work as a full installation in the gallery. You'll see we have a two part photo series and we'll have four of these costumes that are made of vinyl tablecloths. And uh, there's some t-shirts underneath there for the mannequins so they look not, not naked, but this uh, running train here of this character. And I'll pass to another one here. Uh, a detail shot a little bit closer, seeing the necklace and the headdress. And then uh, the uh, opposite view from the room and final view the detail of the dress itself that the artist wore in her performance in this image in the back here where you can show it, you can see it there. Now, Jody's work, hi Jody, good to see you. Hi, nice to see you, Justin. So Jody's work deals a lot with colonial, decolonialization, colonial history, but also your, uh, your racial and cultural heritage being of Jamaican, but also Chinese uh, ancestry. And I think that's a really interesting um, connection. Uh, the Chinese are very populist in the, um, in the Caribbean area and in, in that part of the world because of the history of Chinese immigration. Uh, we did an exhibition when I was the curator at the Chinese American Museum. We did an exhibition exactly on the subject and just seeing the great depth of culture that's shared and the richness of, of the Jamaican culture um, having such a strong Chinese influence over the years due to immigration there. So that itself could be a whole conversation. So I'm not going to focus on that, but let's just talk specifically about the cultural symbolism at the heart of your work. Uh, there's a lot of performative, your body is in it again, like doing the work of performing in it. And a lot is made by hand. A lot of really beautiful costumes and drawings are, are produced in your studio. So if you don't mind, um, let's start with that. What is the symbolism behind this? What are the gestures and the rituals that you used in your actions? And what, why did you go about creating this work called Picnic Parade? Well, um, I guess I could start by saying that um, I'm really attracted to uh, the materials that I grew up seeing a lot of. And a lot of this is um, these imported materials like plastics. Um, first of all, I grew up in Jamaica and um, didn't come to this country until I was pretty much like 12 years old. And growing up there in this very colorful uh, tropical environment and surrounded by lush nature everywhere and um, seeing it over time, and every time I would go back to visit, it would seem as if it's more and more polluted. Um, and, and I was thinking about um, a lot about the environment and where where are we headed in terms of um, the idea of progress. They're always like working on development and um, at the same time uh, living in a third world country. So what they, whatever they would call it, the third world country, um, constantly um, having to rely on um, trade and um, seeing these fabrics, these um, inexpensive materials being imported into the country and um, ending up in, in not necessarily a landfill, but ha having having um, the people having to deal with where what to do with their trash is something that kind of lingered in the back of my mind. And so, um, also growing up in the going to see my grandparents in the countryside and seeing this uh, vinyl material um, covering all parts of the house, like the, the tabletops in the kitchen um, and even like the living rooms and um, these tchotchkes and what have you is um, 
kind can of what brought me to what, working with this material. Can I ask you, jump in real quick? So growing up in the Chinese American culture, all the aunties and mama's friends and stuff had their sofa cushions and chairs <laughs> covered in plastic. Is that the same with the Jamaican aunties and cousins? Did you have to like sit on the chair and like slide around on the chair because like you're wearing running pants and you're like slipping? Does it, does it, is that with anybody else? Well, I mean, I mean, not, I'm not, I'm not going to speak on that per se. I mean, like, um, in my particular household with my parents, it wasn't so much like that, but like more of my, like my grandparents' generation, I would see a lot more of that um, in the island, um, like plastic covering the chair, the chairs and be beautiful velvet underneath, but then there's this like plastic covering. Um, and it was, it, kind of, it kind of became a material to kind of preserve, you know, this, um, precious object that's underneath, you know, because things were hard to come by. And um, I don't know, I, I, I think I kind of lost track of your question a little bit, but um, so I've been working on these series of um, picnics since 2009 um, and, and integrating this material. And um, it first began as just a, a number of collage pieces um, meant to be floor pieces like installations. And um, I started to use this same plastic 99 cents tablecloth that's typically from the Chinese 99 cent stores um, to, to wrap objects. And then I started to become uh, more interested in, in um, embodying um, embodying this material like through performance um, and, and in making myself be the protagonist in these um, installations or um, processions um, to kind of uh, reclaim space um, and to participate with, with, with everyday people. So, um, yeah, I love it. And then there's also that idea of reclaiming space and participating with everyday people. Can you get into a little bit about that? What was the, the ritual that you guys created in the picnic parade? And, uh, you know, if you have anything to share about that, that'd be great. And talking about what that ritual means. A lot of your work deals with ritual. Um, so yeah, I know that there is a video that we want to play at some point too. So let's talk a little bit about the action and what that means for you, ritual and symbolism in your work. Well, um, this piece is, uh, that's in the show is kind of like maybe the second iteration of me playing this goddess character or this more like maternal figure. Um, and, and for me, like when you met, like mentioned in, in the statement about Oya, inspired somehow by Oya, the goddess of the marketplace. Um, Oya, you know, being of this African Orisha and, and coming out of this tradition, um, she is like symbolic of, of, um, of nature. She's about feminine leadership and she's about, um, uh, winds and, and migration and, and storms and all of that. So I'm thinking about all of this with the work and thinking about um, also about my ancestry, um, both sides of my, my, my family, um, the maternal and the paternal side um, were very involved in agriculture. Um, and in terms of the ritual, um, I, I wanted to, um, place some emphasis on, on, on nature and nature we consume um, in terms of like um, eating um, natural organic food and, and thinking about water and nutrition and care. So in the ritual part of the performance, typically I would have a basket of fruit on my head and I'm doing some kind of um, endurance work, whether it's like walking for miles with a 15 pound basket on my head and sometimes having my hands down and just all about relying on that balance um, and and serving um, these 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 organic 
um, fruits and vegetables, fruits I, I, is more what it is, um, to people um, kind of as a gesture um, about having access to, um, to healthy foods. So um, this, this um, serving of fruit is one of the rituals and also um, to accompany that, um, I would have my, my male servants, my white male servants um, cater to my guests by serving them water and the fruit. Uh, so yeah, amazing. And a lot of this is about reclaiming again, uh, uh, an identity, decolonizing the body, uh, decolonizational processes and reclaiming spaces for yourself too, I feel. Um, it's really powerful work to me. I, I see there's a lot of your work deals with race and power too. Um, do you want to speak to that at all or? Uh, sure. Um, so in this particular work, I'm thinking about um, the role of, of the mother, the caretaker. Um, it's, it's inspired by my, my grandmothers um, who, uh, one of them on my father's side, she would tell me about how back in the day in Jamaica, she would like walk up and down the hills and she had no shoes and she had to carry her scallion crop to the market. Um, and, and I'm also thinking about how, um, in a way that there's some autonomy with that. Like she never had a boss, but she, you know, she had land and so she was able to produce crops to sell to the marketplace. And um, I'm also thinking about how um, there, is this, there is this relationship to, to what's going on today with women of color um, or people of color um, um, and the oppression or like lack of freedom and lack of land um, or access to land space here in this country in particular, it's, it's not as easy to come by. And um, especially with farming and farming while black, it's like a whole other topic, but, um, and I'm thinking about the oppressor and, and, and the white patriarchy and, and how it's because of this oppression that um, we, a lot of us people of color might not have access to this. And I'm also thinking about um, in terms of like the Asian or the Chinese perspective, you know, um, thinking about how um, it was due to the abolition of slavery where um, the Asian men from, from, from China, specifically Southern China, were brought over to the Americas to cultivate the crops, to replace the, the, the African, the enslaved Africans on the, on the fields, you know, the sugarcane fields or the cotton fields. And, and, and that also um, happened here in the United States too. So there is this, um, I want to say there, it, there's like a tie there. There is this um, connection there um, with 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 how this was experienced in the Caribbean and also as well here in this country. Yeah, very powerful themes. Really amazing. Um, I love your work. I love the performative aspect of it. I love the fun of it. So all the works in this sh in this show are fun, which is a hard thing to say, especially when dealing with topics like. Mm -hmm. colonial power with religiosity, you know, with all this kind of these really heavy issues. But I think that at the end of the day, when you see your work in the show, it's joyful. And then there's a lot of celebration with it. And I just find that to be important. All the works that we're looking at today, they're celebrating something. So it may be reclaiming something, but it's reclaiming it without like, um, without um, demeaning anybody else or without, you know, putting somebody else down is reclaiming it by empowering us to enjoy you, enjoy it with you. And I find that to be very important. I would like to actually play a clip from the video um, of the performance, if that's okay. So people can get an idea Definitely. of my interaction with people on the street. So um, I believe Shar has that link. Um, where did it pop up? Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the wrong video. That's, that's the wrong video. 
so that was a, uh, of an uh, that was of a performance in um, in Bristol, UK, a few years ago. But um, the video I'd like to show is of the performance of Picnic Parade performed at uh, in Jamaica, Queens, um, as part of my residency at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, and. Um, the photographs that are in the show I wanted to point out are um, have are, are in front of the King Manor Museum, which is um, the the home of the abolitionist uh, Rufus King, um, who lived around the time of 17, 1755 to eighteen twenty seven. So um, his house is still standing in in Jamaica, Queens, and I, I thought it was a perfect here, backdrop. Sure. Oh, okay. I have it, Justin. Oh, you do? Uh, okay, great. Okay, yeah, thank you. I have it now. Sorry about that. I guess it okay. advanced when I was waiting. So, okay, we'll play it now. Thanks for waiting. Sure. Thank you. So um, as you see, I have people of different races, different, you know, um, existing in one picnic blanket and it becomes like this utopian paradise of sorts um, um, where, and also kind of having um, my, my white male performers um, be the servants and um, kind of, even the playing field, I guess, if you, for lack of a better term. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, let's, let's, uh, we're, we're scheduled till three. Thank you, Jody. I really appreciate your work and I really appreciate your perspective and sharing your work with us. Um, I'd like to, um, see if we could open up for some questions. Do you think that'd be okay now for everybody? I know we were going to ask the artists ask questions of each other, but we're running kind of we're running, we had so much great content that I think maybe we just open it up to the public now. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, all right. 
So we have Chanel, Jody, and Jeffrey all here. Uh, if anybody has a question, feel free to chat to us or ask questions. And if nobody has any questions, then I will let the artists ask questions of each other. And then we'll just be wrapping up um, pretty soon. But um, would anybody from the audience like to start us off and ask any, are any questions of these artists? Hi, Justin. Um, this is Vivian. All the attendees, the guests are muted. So um, we did get a Q&A question um, in, from the window. It says, what is the significance of the hair in Chanel's work? This is from Beth Takagawa, our CD at the museum. Sure. Um, so the hair comes from the, the story of Futakuchi Onna, who um, her, the, her teeth, she has two sets of teeth and they're embedded into her hair. So um, hair being a significant part of like the, the hidden um, monstrosity of that particular um, folklore figure. So I wanted to bring in the hair into the piece. And also it's a way, um, I originally thought of the piece as a performance venue. So pre-COVID, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go to Seattle and I'm gonna do a performance. And um, that like maybe during the opening, <laughs> that didn't happen. But it's also a way that you know, before, this is actually my first installation. So I just want to say that the, um, I've been doing, I do a lot of costume work. So my idea was how can you create an installation that becomes also costume? Um, and also Jody, I'm super inspired by your work because I see that as well, like how your dress became an in installation. And, and I've seen Jody's work live and it is absolutely fantastic. It is incredible. Um, so I like the idea of being like a performer transformer of being able to go um, which is like some engineering and some sewing from costume to installation. So thank you so much for that question. There was another question that was posted that said uh, for Jeffrey, Michael, Angel, are all the names of your brethren, your brothers, uh, plays on famous artists. Michael Angel. Is there a famous artist named Michael Angel? Michelangelo. Oh. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Never got it. No, actually, uh, that's crazy. Um, no, the brothers are. Uh, that's so funny. Um, uh, I was born in 83. And so I took the 22 most popular boy names in 1983 in America, put them in a bag, and then I made their names in 2008. So I took the 22 most popular American boy names in another bag and I just mixed them up. So it's all, it's all random. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we were, one other artist said, please read my comment as a question. Her name is Decoy Gallerina. She asks, I'm so inspired by this, the depth and articulate understanding being shared. I'm sitting right this absorbed into hundreds. the feathers the mind for the ice hair cutting become a bit controversial to the use of hair it is for the verbal tune to be acted hair cutting except for hunters okay there's no question here but uh okay i'm sorry hey decoy if you're listening and you want to ask a question please feel free to repose that statement in a question we'll be happy to answer it anybody else want to type a question to the chat or pose it on the question and answer i wanted to here's um... a question from blake nakatsu question for all Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. Please go. Well, I was just going to read Blake's question on the on the answer question and answer board. Do you want to step in first and say something? No. Go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Blake Nakatsu's question here. Uh, question for all artists: What do you hope youth to take away or consider in your work, particularly around the systems you critique? That's a tough question. Good work, Blake. I'll Who's chime first? in. Jeffrey? Um, okay. I'll chime in. Yeah. Um, like I said, I was in a fraternity in college. And like, even when I was a kid, it was like, I was a child actor and I was always trying to get those roles, but there's not a lot of roles for little Asian kids. Right. Um, I think my artwork is just kind of showing that I can be the main character in America, in an American story in something here in the States. You know, Crazy Rich Asians was like crazy because there's an Asian character that's the main character, right? 
my work, I think, um, maybe it's not as uh, 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 conspicuous in the work that's at Wing Luke, but I think in my work in general, it's just like, wow, this guy that looks like this gets to do all these things. Um, and so as J Justin said about reclaiming things, like I feel like I'm trying to take those roles. Um, so, yeah. um, I would like to answer that. Um, I hope that when I make this work and I take it on the street, for instance, it's very exposed to all kinds of people. And what I hope that young people take away from it when they see it is, um, that a woman can be a, pers a person that is in charge or a leader, um, a woman of color can. Um, I want them to think about, in terms of systems of critique, um, that anyone can find a way to um, a voice, like just, I wanted to think about finding a voice or a way to um, to critique the systems that we have in place today, um, whether it's through protest or or um, creative work or even in just what you do in your everyday life. Um, while we have the power to, you know, that it's possible. I love that question. I, I work with a lot of youth, so I really appreciate that. Thank you, Blake. Um, I think that it just goes back to if, first of all, like be weird, don't be afraid to, to be weird and just integrate all these little aspects that of things you're interested in. Don't be afraid to just bring them together and see what happens. Um, if you haven't seen it before, that's, that's good. It's good. In some ways we're like, you know, with lack of representation, it's, it's hard to envision yourself in the world um, or as an artist, but it also opens up an opportunity for you to create something completely new. And um, if there's the stories that you're seeking, you, you have to be the ones to, to make those stories. So like for me, if there's no like explicitly queer um, yokai monsters, like, well, then that's exactly what I'm gonna do then. So thanks for the question. Okay, so the last question from the audience is, uh, do we, what was your inspiration for making art? I know we've been through this a lot. Um, we've all kind of touched a little bit, but maybe in a real quick statement, does somebody or do anybody want to talk about a single point of inspiration that maybe they haven't mentioned? Or is there a certain thing you want to say just real quick? I just want my father to love me. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? That's a good one. <laughs> I think it's a nice joke. It's just like that approval. It's like, as a minority person, like a lot of my work is like, I just want to be seen, right? So <laughs> I think you'll find a lot of that, that, me reclaiming something, me like vandalizing something, just trying to like show my power. So, so the other day, I'm 39 right now. I have three kids. I'm like well out of my youth. The other day I was like, I want to ask my mom, I was like, mom, am I still letting you down? <laughs> That's like really, I felt like I needed to ask that. I didn't, I was afraid to, but I was like, still, I'm going to say, Jeffrey, right on with that. Okay, so uh, another last question here. Do we want to ask, let's, let's transition to the end right now with a real quick way to ask each other something. So as the panelists, um, you know each other's work, you know each other to some degree. Uh, I would like to maybe ask Joy to start. Um, is there a question you could pose of another panelist real quick? And then we'll go popcorn one to the other and then we'll wrap it up. And nothing, it doesn't have to be like tell us your life story, just something that interests you about their work from a, the perspective of the artist. Okay, you want me to start? Okay, I had a question for Chanel, um, but she may have uh, alluded to the answer in her talk. Um, the question that I had in mind was to, um, if she could tell us more about her use of material. And I, and I assumed at first it was silk, but then I found out it was satin. And I wanted to ask her about fake hair and what these materials symbolize for her. Um, but I also wanted to ask about repetition, the use of repetition in her work. Um, I don't know, maybe tell, maybe tell us more about how she came up, how, she, how you came about um, working with repetition. 
Thank you, Jody. That is a really good question. I think about repetition a lot because my work has tons of repetition. Um, and no one's ever asked me that question before. Um, so I am a printmaker. I don't always talk a lot about the process, but I love screen printing. I'm obsessed with it. And when you're printmaking, you can easily pull out multiple prints, multiple prints. It's really funny. Like I'm just surrounded by massive amounts of prints like in my studio. And I love it. I feel like um, it allows you to populate a costume, a, um, an environment uh, really quickly. It allows you to experiment. It makes things less precious when you have multiples. Um, it also allows for me to experiment with color and, um, and different fabrics too, seeing how, they, how different colors respond on different um, pieces. So yeah, the, the repetition, and it just ends up working really well in terms of the construction aspect of, of the work, whether it's the repetition of the eyeballs or teeth or in the costumes themselves, needing for a lot of the pieces to be mirrored on both sides of the body. So thank you, Jody. I appreciate that. Chanel, can you go. pose, yeah, would you be able to pose yeah. a question? Sure. Um, uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I, I love Jeffrey's work. I actually wanted to pull this really quick. My first piece of artwork is a Jeffrey piece um, <laughs> in my home uh, from a gallery in Chicago, Fluxus. Um, and uh, when I see this piece gives me a lot of joy. And um, I was wondering what role does joy play in your work and also your personal studio art practice? My sister's name is Joy. I know, is that weird? Again, family. <laughs> no, um, mm. that's true actually. Um, but uh, I'm just a positive person and I love to celebrate everything. I think um, I could really be really sad all the time. I could, I mean, I could really be sad all the time if I wanted to, but, um, and maybe there have been dark times in my life, right? Especially before I came out. I mean, like just weighing down on myself and uh, it really motivates me to find the, that the grass is greener on the other side and then you get there and then it's not what you expected. So I think a lot of my artwork is always kind of like aspiring to be something else, trying to do this. And then you look back at the things you've made and you're like, this is not this thing that I made with puffy paint, which is at Wing Luke now, that is what it is. It doesn't have to aspire to be like, I tried to work with Swarovski crystals or something like that, right? Like the joy came in the process of the making of the work. The joy came in the idea that I'm gonna make this collage from the ideas itself, like these bros doing this activity of throwing the necklaces on the statuary, there was a joy there and maybe I was aspiring for something else. But again, retrospectively looking back, it's like, no, this was the art. This is the art, you've made it. And now I can you know, make something else. Um, so I do get a joy just from the act of creating something, something new and different. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you. Last um, question, well, Jeffrey, Jody. You... Yeah. yeah, I'll ask Jody a question. This is my uh, early engagement with Jody's work. So I'm, I was so excited to learn more about you, Jody. You are a performer. You are a performer. Yeah. So um, I was just so excited to see all the work. And um, this is kind of going to go back to process and just how we think about our work as artists. Um, especially in 2020, how are you approaching, or how did you approach kind of maybe the performances you're doing this year, or even the performances you're looking towards uh, in the future? I mean, we have to social distance, we have to wear masks if we're around other people. I'm just wondering how the pandemic really affected you as a performer uh, making work that is around other bodies. Wow, that's a good question. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, well, um, I'm thinking about, well, how can we safely have a performance in a public space? Um, I'm actually working right now on a performance um, that should hopefully take place in February. And there are challenges around that because um, typically I would have members of the audience 
um, play a role in the performance or to have that, like, I would like to walk up to them and give them that opportunity to, to play a role in the performance. And now it's not so easy. So I've had to like um, shift my thinking there and, and think about working with people that would be comfortable working with me. And of course, still following social distancing guidelines um, think about costumes that I'll never um, get back, creating costumes for them that I'll never get back. Um, thinking about sanitation and, and how, and thinking about PPE as part of the costuming and um, implementing these um, PP, PPE gear as part of the costumes. Um, and uh, maybe of course, the gallery that I'm working with, they're saying that they would take people's temperature before they come in. So I'm thinking about like, for instance, I'm working on this performance and I'm, I, I have five performers, but I think I'm going to have to have 10, uh, maybe an extra five people lined up just the, in, in case of emergency, you know, um, and people can't participate anymore. Um, and also it's given now it has to be like screened on Instagram live instead of having a full live audience. So I'm going to have a lot less people in the space witnessing the work up front. Um, yeah, and I'm also, also by looking at your work, Jeffrey, um, I see how you play all these characters and with the performance that I'm, my ongoing performance that I'm working on now, which typically it would involve like 15 performers, ideally like 10 to 15 performers at once. Um, I am finding myself playing the roles of all of these characters um, of the Jamaican, inspired by the Jamaican junk canoe, there are about 15 or so characters. And I want to embody all of these characters now and do performances for video. So I've been working in that way. Um, lately, and I'm not sure if that will, um, how long that will go on because of the pandemic, but I'm actually enjoying embodying all of these characters right now. Thank you, Jody. Thanks sure. for the questions, everybody. Uh, thanks to the Wing Luke for allowing us this platform, for structuring and building this platform for us to share and connect. Uh, thanks again to the artist. And I'm really happy to be here and I'm honored to be part of this. I'd like to pass it now to, uh, to Jessica. Thanks, Justin. Thank you everyone for attending today's program. Thank you to Justin, to Jody, to Jeffrey, to Chanel. I really appreciated the um, open conversation and the just very like vulner vulnerable conversations about your work. And I'm just really grateful to hear more about you all and about the amazing work that you are doing and will continue to do. Um, I am excited to see what the future brings. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsors for the program and for the exhibition. Uh, our presenting season sponsors, the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Satterberg Foundation, the Office of Arts and Culture in Seattle, our lead sponsor, Arts Fund, our prime sponsor, the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Foundation, major sponsor, Lester and Phyllis Epstein Foundation, supporting sponsors, Artworks, Artswa, and the Pride Foundation. Um, thank you to our museum donors and members, including the Leadership Circle for making this program possible. If you would like to become a member of the museum, please visit our website. We would love to have you as a member. Um, this exhibition is scheduled to be on view through May 16th, 2021, so please be on the lookout for when we reopen. I really hope you all get a chance to see it, as you can imagine from this program and hearing from the artists. It's truly a powerful show and one I really feel honored um, to have been involved with. It was amazing to work with all of you. Um, thank you again so much and stay safe and healthy during this holiday season. Thank you. Thank you so much. We didn't get uh, our friend 
young Barong to give us some music, exiting music. DJ, you gonna kick a track for us? <laughs> I think young Barong left the building. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Young Barong is still there. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can feel it. <laughs> Calling it out. <laughs> Maybe Great DJ Chanel. Yeah, DJ Chanel. <laughs> right? Yeah, you want me to do it now? It's going to be off my iPad. <laughs> it's going to be off yeah. my iPad. <laughs> Throw it back. Let's hear it. Just pull, hold it up to your microphone and be like, hello. Right? <laughs> That's so funny. I think Sean may have left. And um, and attendees are leaving. We always have a few that stick around to the very, very last moment. So thanks very much. And um, all your websites and handles are in the chat. If there's any other viewers, any other attendees here to cut and paste that so you can follow all the artists and Justin and follow the wing Luke. Um, shall I hit leave? If you must. I'm just so happy <laughs> seeing all your pretty faces. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks a lot so of fun. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Right, thank you. Talk to you later. Anything else, Vivian? Bye. No, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. And when you're when be safe, everyone. And when it when you are able, come visit. All right. Yes, thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah. Okay. All right, bye.